Did you know you can watch a life-giving kids service each week? Your kids can learn about Jesus in a fun, uplifting way. New episodes release every Friday for you to watch and discuss. Make kids service a part of your kids' watching lineup. What is a pocket church? Well, it's really simple. Pocket churches are small, intimate gatherings where you can connect and grow with others in your Jesus journey. Together, we watch the message, we worship, and we talk it over with the discussion questions that are provided each week. Kids Service is available on demand to watch in a separate room or on a smart device. You can do a pocket with your family, friends, or in a small gathering. Every pocket is different in when and where they meet. Find a day and time that works best for you to attend or host. The only qualifications you need to be a host is that you enjoy being around people and pointing them to Jesus. We will give you all the tools you need through a weekly email with hosting tips. It's that simple. Hello, Life Church family. Thanks for being a part of our lives. Thanks for being a part of our life from all over the nation and really all over the globe. A big shout out to our friends from Ireland who planted a church and Life Church, you helped plant this church in Dublin, Ireland three years ago. And so thanks for being a part of that. In fact, your giving helps us go beyond the 920. You help us to start ministries in San Diego. Life Church downtown is fruit of Life Church from going beyond just De Pere and going beyond online in our city. It is for everywhere and anyone. Thanks for being a part of our life. Thanks for giving. As always, there's four ways to give. You can do that now. Enjoy the rest of the service. Hey friends, open your Bibles to the book of Philemon. If you're not in a place where you have access to a traditional Bible, you can open up the YouVersion app, where it's also called the Bible app, and all the notes and scriptures, those have already been uploaded. Wherever it is that you're watching us from, I love you, and I'm so grateful that you're part of our extended family. Postcards are the most public type of correspondence I can think of. There's no privacy. They're open to the public. You don't write anything on a postcard you don't want everyone to read. Like you don't write anything private or anything intimate on a postcard because at least three people are gonna read it before the person who's supposed to read it actually reads it. Like you have the person working at the post office who sorts and processes mail, who reads it on their break. Like, hmm, let's see what's happening in Wichita. Or then you have the mail carrier who reads it under a tree while they eat their lunch. Like, Wichita, huh? I've never been to Wichita, I wonder what's going on over there. And then worst of all, you have whoever gets the mail at your house. Teenagers, don't send love notes on postcards. Teenage boy, hey boo. Teenage girl's dad, boo. Who in the heck is boo? Postcards aren't designed for privacy. Because of their size, they really weren't designed for substance. They're designed to be snippets, snapshots. But yet the Bible has these five postcards that refute that. Small in size, but substantial in content. I wanna continue our series today by talking about one of those in a message we're calling a postcard to Philemon. Let's pray. God, we love you, we honor you, we're grateful to you. Thank you for who you are, for what you do that allows us to be who we are and lets us do what we do, which is love you and serve you. And so today I pray for my friends, I pray for myself, God, that our hearts would be changed, that they would be made more like you, 
Make us, mold us, change us into whatever you want us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, so at first glance, especially when you're a new believer, the Bible can look really intimidating. Almost 1,300 pages, it's imposing. When you open it, you discover it's separated into two sections. The first section, 39 books called the Old Covenant or the Old Testament, was written over a little more than a 1,500-year period and was all written and compiled before Jesus ever appeared. And yet, every one of the books speaks of him and prophesies or pre-tells of the impact that he was gonna have on our world. Then when you get to the second section, 27 books called the New Covenant or the New Testament, you see that they were all written during the last half of the first century over a course of about 50 years. And they're all after the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And all these books in some way, shape, or form look back on the cross. And when you take this book and you just lay it on a table, it looks intimidating. It's about 75 pages longer than Tolstoy's War and Peace. It's stout, robust, but in truth, if you were to start in Genesis 1-1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and you end it at Revelation 22-21, may the grace of the Lord Jesus be with God's holy people, and you read it at just a normal pace, it would take you almost exactly 80 hours to read the whole thing. I mean, some of you have spent more time than that on Facebook just this month. Uh, the longest of its books with 150 chapters is the book of Psalms. The 119th verse alone has 176 verses. Like, don't try to memorize that one. But then there are these five books, these postcards that are just one chapter, one in the Old Testament and four in the New. And if you took all five of these postcards and you added them together, you only have 98 verses. It's less than one of that psalm. And it can make you wonder why God even went to the trouble of preserving these little memos that these authors wrote. They seem like they could have just been written on a handful of sticky notes. But it's like someone who keeps every love note their spouse has ever written to them or every piece of art their kids have ever made. They're significant even though they're short like really short. You can read them in almost no time. Like the first one we run across in the table of contents, although it's the third one we're talking about, it's just 25 verses. You can read it in about four minutes. In the length of a typical song, you could have read an entire book of the Bible. So let's try it. This letter's from Paul, a prisoner for preaching the good news about Jesus and from our brother Timothy. I'm writing to Philemon, our beloved co-worker, and to our sister, Aphia, our fellow soldier, Archippus, and to the church that meets in your house. May God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. I always thank God when I pray for you, Philemon, because I keep hearing about your faith in Jesus and your love for all of God's people. And I'm praying that you'll put into action the generosity that comes from your faith as you understand and experience all the good things we have in Christ. Your love's given me much joy and comfort, my brother, for your kindness has often refreshed the hearts of God's people. That's why I'm boldly asking you for a favor. I mean, I could demand it in Jesus' name because it's the right thing for you to do, but because of our love, I prefer simply to ask. Consider this as a request for me, Paul, an old man and also now a prisoner for the sake of Jesus. I appeal to you to show kindness to my child Onesimus. I became his father in the faith while here in prison. Onesimus hasn't been of much use to you in the past, but now he's very useful to both of us. I'm sending him back to you, and with him comes my heart. I wanted to keep him here with me for a while while I'm in these chains for preaching the good news, and he'd have helped me on your behalf, but I didn't want to do anything without your consent. I wanted you to help because you were willing, not because you were forced. It seems you lost Onesimus for a little while so that you could have him back forever. He's no longer like a slave to you. He's more than a slave. He's a beloved brother, especially to me. Now he'll mean much more to you, both as a man and as a brother in the Lord. So if you consider me your partner, welcome as him as you've welcomed me. If he's wronged you in any way or owes you anything, charge it to me. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I'll repay it. And I won't even mention that you owe me your very soul. Yes, my brother, please do me this favor for the Lord's sake. Give me this encouragement in Christ. I'm confident as I write this letter 
that you'll do what I ask and even more. Oh yeah, one more thing. Please prepare a guest room for me because I'm hoping God will answer your prayers and let me return to you soon. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ, sends you his greetings and so do my coworkers, Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Man, you read that, it's so good. I mean, like, it's rich. It's so heartfelt. But most people will go to church their entire lives without ever hearing a single message on the book of Philemon. And I think it's probably because at first glance, it seems insignificant. First, there's no imposing thought. There's no great heresy confronted or corrected. There, there's not even any mention of biblical doctrine. But here's Paul, the great apostle, with a pen in his own hand, which is significant. And you're going to see why later. But that's significant because in that culture, when a person wrote something with their own hand, anything they committed to was legally binding and fully enforceable. So Paul personally writes this little note and he sends it 1,200 miles from where he was, which is where? Well, let's look at Acts chapter 28 because if we don't know Paul's setting, Philemon is essentially meaningless. It's a study in futility. So Acts 28, 16, it says, when we arrived in Rome, Paul was permitted to have his own lodging, though he was guarded by a soldier. Now, at this point, Paul had taken three great missionary journeys in his life. He traveled all over Turkey, all over Greece, and into some sections of Europe, and he was establishing this new awareness of Jesus. And throughout all those missionary journeys, he desperately wanted to go to Rome. It was the deepest desire of his heart. So this verse really indicates the realization of a dream. Have you ever had a place you really wanted to visit? Like you thought, before I die, I wanna go to blank. You've always wanted to peer over the edge of the Grand Canyon, walk on the Great Wall of China, or snorkel at the Great Barrier Reef. Now for Paul, that was Rome. It was the capital of the world. He wanted to share Jesus with the world's elite, the influencers. He ultimately wanted to sit and have a conversation with the emperor, Nero, who the Romans believed was God on earth. And, and if you wanted to get next to the emperor, you'd never do that through a politician. You'd do that through a member of the military. But it was like really highly unlikely that a Roman soldier would ever come to Paul to hear about Jesus. So Paul is taken by God to Rome, but not like he planned. He didn't come in as a prophet. He was brought in as a prisoner. And as a prisoner, he's placed under house arrest. And verse 30 tells us, for the next two years, Paul lived in Rome at his own expense. He welcomed all who visited him, boldly proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about Jesus, and no one tried to stop him. So he was in Rome for two years, locked in a house, footing the bill for his own captivity. But for Paul, it wasn't a season of oppression. It was a season of opportunity because when you were under house arrest in Rome, you were chained to a Roman soldier at all times. And so he'd wanted to witness to Roman soldiers half his life. And now God chained one to him and the soldier couldn't get away. And not just one soldier, every eight hours, there was a shift change. So Paul sat there all day, every day, like, hello, how are you? Do you know about Jesus? Well, let me take the next eight hours to tell you about him. And the guy just couldn't get away. Talk about a captive audience. Yes, the dad jokes are strong in this one. And, and he led a bunch of these guys to Jesus. In fact, in one of his letters, he, he writes, those in Caesar's palace, they greet you. That means some of the soldiers that Paul had led to Jesus ended up getting right next to Nero because God has a magnificent way of pulling off his plan if we just stay out of his way. I mean, I always wanted to make it to the NFL. I always thought it would be as a player. But 20 years after I thought that dream had died, he'd bring me into the hallowed halls of Lambeau Field. Not as a player for the Packers, but as the pastor of the Packers, which has given me far more opportunity and impact than I ever would have had through my own plan. So here's Paul chained in his own house for two years with a constant stream of people coming and going just to hear about Jesus. 
But what's that got to do with Philemon? Everything. Because Philemon is a message about second chances and showing mercy, a message about grace and equality in Christ. It's written with a background of Roman slavery. And you can't imagine what that really meant. Like it was hell on earth. Slaves in the Roman Empire weren't even considered humans. Masters literally could do whatever they wanted without any recourse from the law. They could beat them, burn them, boil them in oil, even bury them alive. And some historians said that masters would bury their slaves alive, leave them in there long enough, and then dig them up just before they would die so that they could repeat the process of abuse. They were free to abuse them verbally, emotionally, physically, and even sexually, and no one could say a thing about it. Pliny actually tells a story about a time when a Roman slave was carrying a tray of crystal goblets into the courtyard. He tripped, dropped, and broke one goblet. And in an instant, his master, Pollio, had him thrown into the fish tank in the middle of the courtyard where the savage lamries tore him to pieces. One historian shares how within the Roman Empire, there were more than 60 million slaves one of whom was named Onesimus, who lived under the rule of Philemon and Colossae. Philemon, a Christian slave owner. An oxymoron that a couple thousand years later in our own American history, Southern slave owners would massively take out of context and use to justify their heinous acts. But this is not a book to justify the act of slavery. We know that not just because of what's written, but because of who wrote it. And when we go back and read the other works of the Apostle Paul, he time and time again comes against the practice of slavery. So we know that this isn't a book to justify the act of slavery. Instead, it's a book about a slave and his salvation. Onesimus lived under the rule of Philemon, and, and one day this useless, unbelieving, godless man robbed his master, ran for his life, and somehow he landed 1,200 miles away where he could blend in with the millions of other slaves in the capital city, where in the process of time, he was led to the house where Paul lived. And in the marvelous plan of God, Paul had the joy of introducing him to Jesus. But now there was a conflict. Here's a born-again slave who had wronged his master, but knows if he returns, his life is at stake. When a slave wronged his master and ran away, he was typically killed. He killed in one of four ways. He, he was either drowned, strangled, crucified, or thrown in with a pack of wild beasts to be torn apart. Now, if he wasn't killed, he'd be maimed. He'd probably have one foot cut off so he could never run away again. At best, if his master showed great mercy, he'd be branded with a giant F on his forehead for fugitivus, Latin for runaway. It's where we get our word fugitive. He was marked for life so everyone would know not to trust him. Onesimus needed help. He wanted to make things right, and the only way to do that was through his spiritual father, Paul. So Paul writes a letter to Philemon encouraging him to forgive the fugitive. But there's more. Watch this. From Paul, a prisoner of Jesus and Timothy, our brother, to our beloved brother and fellow worker Philemon and his family and the church in his house. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace and peace. It's Paul's two favorite things. Now, Remember where he's going. You and I know, but Philemon didn't. He, he just thought he had gotten a letter from his friend Paul, just a, just a little note from Rome, and he couldn't wait to read it. And, and the note says, grace and peace. And Philemon probably leaned back and thought, ah, oh, grace and peace. That's what God's given me. Thank you for the reminder, friend. But, but, but he doesn't know what Paul was going to ask. Remember, the last thing on his mind is probably a runaway slave named Onesimus. And Paul doesn't even mention Onesimus right away. In fact, not for 10 verses. And, and you can understand that, can't you? Like, have you ever had to go to your parents and tell them something difficult, something you did wrong? And so you tell them 19 things that you love about them before you even start the conversation? It, it's just common sense. Like, he, he doesn't write a letter that says, Dear Philemon, accept Onesimus back, signed Paul. If he had, he probably wouldn't have received a positive answer. Like, are you kidding me, Paul? Do you know what that guy did to me? 
But, but look at what he says to Philemon. Verse four, I thank God for you and mention you in my prayers. Verse five, I hear of your love. I pray that the fellowship of your faith may become effective. Verse six, now verse seven, I come to you with great joy and comfort in your love. He's saying, what a delight to think of you as a man of love. Like, do you get it? As Philemon read each line, he got more and more encouraged. Paul's pointing out his strengths, which by the way, do you do that? Are you reminding the people in your life of their strengths? The last part of verse seven explains why that's important. The hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you, brother. Nothing's more refreshing than helping a person see their benefits, their strengths. Too many people feel like they're, they're gifted with the gift of criticism and they exercise that gift as regularly as they can. But what about having the gift of refreshment? When you leave, do people say, oh, I'm so glad he's gone? Or, or do they say, wow, I can't wait to be around her again? The difference is between criticism and refreshment. Let me show you a verse that'll help you with that. Proverbs 12, 25. Anxiety in the heart of a man weighs it down, but a good word makes it glad. Guys, people are drowning in anxiety. What are you doing to alleviate that? A good word lifts an anxious heart. How? I'll give you one word. Encouragement. Are you adding courage to the people in your life? Encouragement is always in season. So Paul says, Philemon, when I think about your life, I realize that you're a man given to refreshment. Friends, I want you to take a look back on this past week and ask yourself, how many people did I refresh? When you left them, did their lives feel better? I mean, if we went no further than this, there's already something for us in Philemon. But remember, Onesimus' name still hasn't even been mentioned. So look at verse eight. Therefore, though I have enough confidence in Christ to order you to do what's proper. In other words, bro, I'm an apostle and I can command you to do whatever I say. I could command that you let this man back into your home. And some leaders approach life like that, don't they? But how much better is it to approach it like Paul? I mean, even God says, come now, let us reason together. Though your sins are like scarlet, they can be white as snow. So Paul says, I could force you to do what I want, but for love's sake, I'd rather appeal to you. Then again in verse 10, he says, I appeal to you. And I'm sure by this point, the letter Philemon must be wondering what in the world is going on. And so Paul finally drops it. I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, who I fathered in my imprisonment. And can, like, can you feel the emotion in that? Both Paul's and Philemon's. Paul wants forgiveness, but Philemon wants vengeance. You ever had someone who's really done you wrong? I mean, is it easy to forgive them? No. You go to bed at night plotting their demise and wake up in the morning hoping you can catch them in a corner somewhere. And Philemon was in that place. He'd lived in the memory of the dust he'd seen as Onesimus left in the middle of the night having stolen something precious to him. And Philemon must have thought over and over again, oh, if I could ever just get my hands on that fugitive, I'd brand him like no one's ever been branded before. Then all of a sudden a letter comes and it's from his friend, the most respected apostle in the world, Paul, that says, I appeal to you in love for our brother. And Philemon must have thought, Onesimus is not my brother. He's my slave. He's not even a human. But that line points to our ability to grow through our mistakes. Through a mistake, something happened, something marvelous. Through a bad decision to rip his master off and run for his life, Onesimus was led to Paul, who taught him the power of grace and peace and the need for forgiveness. So Onesimus says, I want to go back. I need to make things right. But Onesimus needed the courage to request forgiveness, and Philemon needed the capacity to release it. And you need both, the courage and the capacity. And both will be hard because a lot of us would describe ourselves the way Paul describes Onesimus. Onesimus, 
who was previously useless to you. You ever feel useless or look at somebody like they are? I mean, Paul doesn't dodge the fact that Onesimus was useless like we were in sin before Jesus. But look at verse 18. But if he's wronged you in any way or owes you anything, charge it to my account. Mm. Remember what I said about why it was important that Paul wrote this with his own hand? This was now legally binding and fully enforceable. He was taking Onesimus' debt upon himself. Talk about the heart of Jesus, who, though we were formerly slaves to and of sin, who'd spent our lives robbing our master, running for our lives, and continually hiding in the crowd, said if we just receive him, He'd take our debt upon himself, write our names in the Lamb's Book of Life, and guarantee us eternal life. He said, Father, if he owes you anything, if she owes you anything, charge it to my account. And isn't that so good? Do you see now how this little postcard called Philemon is relevant to your life? Oh, by the way, do you know how Philemon actually got the note? It was brought to him by Onesimus. No one else could have presented it but Onesimus. No one else could ask for Onesimus's forgiveness except for him. And the same is true for you. No one else can ask for your forgiveness but you. No one else can make penance for you, light a candle on your behalf, or pray you in. You have to risk losing everything, humble yourself, and come to your master for forgiveness. And so I wonder, will you do that today? I hope so, because if you will, you will finally be able to stop running. Would you close your eyes? You know, salvation is really that last line, in an essence, the ability to stop running. I wonder if you've been running. You've been running from your sin, running from your shame, running from yourself, and you say, I can't run anymore. I need to stop. I wanna give you the opportunity to do that. And here's how. The Bible says salvation's really easy. All you have to do is confess with your mouth that you're a sinner and believe that Jesus can forgive you of those sins. And so I'm gonna give you the opportunity to do that. Here's how. I'm gonna repeat a few lines in a prayer and then I'm gonna pause. And when I pause, if you repeat after me and you mean it in your heart, the Bible says you will be saved. You can stop running. So will you do that? Will you say this after me? Say, Jesus, I'm a sinner, but I'm sorry. Please forgive me, come into my life and change me. Make me different, make me new. Be my Lord, be my Savior, in Jesus' name, amen. Friends, congratulations. If you pray that prayer, I would love the opportunity to connect with you, help you walk from where you are to where God wants you to be, which is more like Jesus. And so if you just reach out to us and let us know that you prayed that prayer, we would love the opportunity to connect with you and to follow up with you. But maybe you're watching this and you say, Sean, like I'm a I'm a believer, I'm a Christian. Like if I were to die today, I believe that I would go to heaven. But like Philemon, maybe there's something or someone who has done you wrong and you need to forgive them. If that's you, can I pray for you? And so God, for my friends, that it's heavy, it's hurtful, it's wearisome, God. So I pray that you'd give them strength, that you'd breathe breath into their lungs, refresh them, restore them, revive them, rejuvenate them, and enable them to provide forgiveness as they seek it. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen.
doesn't have to end now. The things you are thinking about, you're questioning, you're mauling over right now, have a conversation with someone. Call someone up and talk about this. Or if you're with someone right now, you could text discussion to 97000. There you can download discussion questions to prompt even more. And if you'd rather listen, try out the Chew On That podcast, where Pastor Scott and a guest talk every week about this very message. You'll find these discussion questions you download will help you with whether you're new to Jesus or you've known Jesus for decades. Either way, they will help you on your Jesus journey.